Peggy. Hello. Uh, so yeah, I'm Nick and mutability for good, not evil, in non-local and global scope. I'm not entirely sure I've also found a good use yet, so mostly for not evil, okay? So, start with the simple stuff. What is mutability? Well, a mutable object is an object which can be changed in place. A mutable object can be changed in place. What is
and therefore create non-buggy code. And yeah, I'd say this is probably half the problem. I wouldn't say necessarily avoid mutability, but make it as clear as possible. My board example isn't very clear. Very few people can understand why it goes wrong until it's explained properly. So let's make our code obvious. I'm going to give a couple of examples. I'm going to give you two pieces of code. They do exactly the same thing. I'm going to ask which one you think makes more sense or is more obvious. Okay, so first example. Can everyone read this? Yeah, kind of? No? no? Can I zoom in on this? Let's uh, see if I can just at least make one. Oh, God, I can't see that at all. <laughs> if I just. Okay, this is going to make it look really weird. <laughs> I didn't change it at all. All right, I'll just explain it. I'll just explain it. So, okay, I've got my first line. If you can see it, it says state equals a list. All right, so I've got a global mutable variable. That's in both lines of code. <laughs> the second one has, the second bit is a function. All right, they both have the same function, more or less, called append data. Except the example on the left takes one argument, data. It then takes the global object state and appends data directly to it, nothing else. The second function over here takes two arguments data and state, so it takes a state object. It appends data to the given state object and then returns that state object. I then have a main block at the bottom, the first one here, simply called it append data with one, so it just depends to state like that. The second one is a bit more wordy. It does append data, takes two variables, one and my state object, and then reassigns it to state. The reassignment is optional, I just prefer to write it that way. Now, based on that, who thinks this option on the left is clearer. Okay, who thinks this option on the right is clearer? Cool. Almost 50-50 split. Interesting. So I vote for the option on the right. Okay, while the code on the left is more concise, smaller, faster to read, if you think about a growing code base, it can quite quickly lose its context. Right, so a very large file with appendage is somewhere in it, you might not immediately know where it is. Even worse, if you have a state.py file where this is defined and then say a util.py in a completely different package, append data almost has no meaning. But where is this going to? I could rename it to append data to state. Uh, it wouldn't fill my PowerPoint presentation, which is why I didn't. But even then, I need to understand what the state object is. I need to go to the function definition and figure it out. The second one, I'm appending directly to an object I pass. So it's a bit clearer for me to understand. I don't really need to go to the definition to understand it. I can pick it up quite quickly. So maybe it's a bit more contentious. I don't see this code very often. I see this sometimes, but this I see quite often. So this is exactly the same scenario but in a class. So again, apologies for those who can't see it, but I have two classes now, both called the stateful class. The init method takes a data object, assigns that to the class, and then it also sets up a class state variable. We then have a method append data, and it does the same thing in one. It doesn't do anything. It just takes the self.data and appends it to self.state in the second one, it takes the state object and appends self.data to it and then returns the state. And then we have a run method, which is essentially our main block. This is more palatable. I see it relatively often. But again, this, in my opinion, is preferable. So again, if I have a very big class, I hope no one's writing big classes, but I think we'd all be lies if we say we hadn't seen any. The append data loses its context when we have a run method quite far away. And if we say inherit, this class, and somewhere down the line we have a child class that calls append data. Again, I don't really know what it's doing straight away, whereas the second one, where I'm explicitly passing in my mutable state, I understand it. Less likely to cause bugs. So, making your code obvious, one part of the thing. The other half for me is understanding when and how to use mutability. As I say, it's a powerful tool. It can be used for all sorts of things. Doesn't mean it should be, right? So I am going to go to a really typical example, which is default mutable arguments. Hands up who knows what they are. <laughs> cool. OK, good. It's a good start. So A. Uh, is that readable? At the back, yeah? yeah. Cool. Great. So I have a really simple function, right? It takes two arguments, A and B. A is positional, fine. B is default, has a default list. List is mutable. It's a default mutable argument, right? So I take B, I append my object A to it, and I return B. Super simple. 
Right, so let's run it. Bunk one. I expect a list with just a single item of one there. Hands up if you agree. Cool, some hesitation. We're good, still going well. So now a little bit more complicated. I expect to return a list of one, two, three, right? Passing this in, I'm appending three to it, one, two, three. Everyone agree? Cool. We're good. So let's recreate the first one now. Am I going to get the same result? No. I get this, okay? Again, for people who don't understand it, this is confusing. Why would it return a different result each time? It doesn't make any sense. Until you consider, again, how functions are made. When we assign this mutable default argument, normally you would expect it to be created each time you call the function, but that's not what happens. This is created on function definition and assigned to the function's default arguments. Right? We can actually see it under the hood if we just go here. There you go. That's our default argument that's now being passed in. Originally, it was just an empty list, but every time we've called it as the default, we've appended one to it. <coughs> so now it looks like that. If we want to be really funky, we can do this. And now if I call it again, it's really different, right? This, uh, this is an obvious code, in my opinion. You can disagree if you want, but I don't think this is good code. I would not recommend using default arguments in this way. But there is some arguments in the community as to whether default arguments are a feature or a bug going on with Grown. I heard earlier, I think most people think it's a bug in this room. Um, when I first saw it, I actually thought it was quite cool. So I thought, oh, I can use this like a feature. And again, disclosure very early on in my career. <laughs> I wouldn't do this anymore. But, uh, I'm not going to do that one. So I had a problem in my code. I was working with a variety of big code base, and I ended up introducing a circular dependency, right? So again, probably quite difficult to read, but I have two files here, A and B. A has two functions, A1, which just prints high, and A2, which runs B1, and B has one function, B1, which runs A1 and then prints there. A imports B, B imports A, I have a circular dependency. Now, typical advice, you should refactor your code. Make it so it's a bit more streamlined, you don't have circular dependencies like this. It's usually quite simple to do. Me being the beginner I was, thought, nah, circular dependencies can be solved with mutable default arguments. It's great. So, this is what I did. Uh, again, probably not going to see it properly, but I have changed B1 quite significantly. I no longer import A, so circular dependencies gone. This is a good thing, right? My B1 now takes two arguments func, which equals none and callables, which equals a list. It's a mutable default argument. I then have a block, which is if func is not none, callables append func. Right, so if I take a function in the first argument, I will append it to my mutable default list. And then I return, I do nothing else. If I don't receive a function, so if, it's, if it is none, I loop through my callables and call each one, and then print there. My A file, only one change, A2 now calls B1 twice calls B1 with A1, and then it calls B1 on its own. Right? Who thinks this works? Hands up. Cool, a few hands. I will prove it to you. So, actually, it's a bit better idea. So, I can come out here. Probably see that a bit clearly. So this is my A file. This is my B file, exactly as explained. Now, I should get high there. And I do. This code is completely functional, does exactly what I wanted to do, what I expected it to do. But if anyone else came along and, let me do this one again. If anyone came along and saw this, I think there will be some questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, the question is, is this a good idea? No, it's not. It's an awful idea. It's probably at least in the top five worst things I've done. <laughs> uh, yeah, never again. So, we come back to the argument. Is there a good use for mutable default arguments? Well, as I said, they solve a lot of problems, but rarely the right way. There's usually another solution you can use which is better. There's a couple of arguments I've seen, memoization, binding a local scope could have some uses. Again, there are other possibilities. I would rather not use mutable default arguments if possible. So in my opinion, avoid. So, 
This is evil code. Right? This is bad code, stuff you shouldn't use mutability for. What's a good use? Well, I'm kind of going to toe the line a little bit here. So if you feel the urge to boo or throw stuff at me, I understand. Please don't until the end, but <laughs> it's OK. Uh, I will try to be as convincing as possible. So let's come back to our circuit dependency issue. As I said, there's a good way to do it with refactoring code, but let's take another approach, okay? And let's see if we can make it more understandable and more usable. And I'm going to do it like this. So some of you probably can't read that, but I actually have it here. There. Go. So I'm using decorators for this. Uh, if you don't understand what decorators are, I probably don't have time to explain them, but I highly recommend learning about them. They're a great part of life. Um, yeah, it adds some complexity, but it makes the way you use it a lot nicer, right? So, I have a decorator, I've called it function register. It takes one argument, func, which is a function, as all decorators take, and it sets up two objects, callables, which is a mutable list and is non local in state to what's going to happen later, and a class called function register, mimicking my decorator name, keeping things as obvious as possible. My class has two methods. Register pre-call, which takes one argument, a callable. It appends this callable to my list here. It's very similar to what I was doing earlier with my mutable leap arguments, but now in a decorator. And then returns a callable. Right? If you don't realize, this is itself also a decorator. We have a decorator inside a decorator. I appreciate this does add some complexity. We then have a second method, call. It's the number method. Um, if you don't know what this does, this allows an object instance to act like a function, right? Like a callable. You have an object instance, you have parentheses on the end. Normally that doesn't work, but if you have a call under method, it works just fine. We take some arguments, we loop through our callables, calling each one, and then return the function, this, with the arguments. And then the decorator returns the function register. Now, okay, this looks relatively confusing to the newcomer to Python. If you understand decorators, I would like to argue that it's not too bad. Uh, it's quite small, self-contained, leave it at that. The key bit is this. This is how you use it. So I have my two functions again, B and A. Now B, I'm going to decorate with my function register. So this becomes an object instead of a class, but an object instead of a function, but it's still portable, and runs print there. The key thing is I've also attached a decorator to it, my register prequel. So when I want to run a function before it, all I need to do is decorate that function with b.register prequel. Right? This takes a into this function, or this method, and appends it to my state here. Right? Who thinks it's going to work? Okay. More confidence than me. I like that. It works perfectly, right? So this solution solves the circuit dependency issue, but it also does a few other things. It's a lot more flexible. I can apply it to any function I want now instead of just my single v1 function. And it's kind of reminiscent of another pattern you see in web development, <coughs> essentially HTTP middleware, right? So in middleware, for instance, in Flask, you'll have a request that comes through. Before you process a request, you might have a function you want to call before, which you middleware, and the same with post, right, right after you run the function. This is the same thing. I have a register pre-call, and if I wanted, I could create a register post-call method and put in a post-call calls. And I'm essentially, I've essentially rebuilt a middleware system for Flask. Again, Flask has this, don't rebuild it yourself, you can just use it, but it's kind of a recognizable pattern. It's a bit more usable than the other one. So personally, I think it works a bit better. Now, I mentioned earlier as well that people argue that memoization can be done with mutable default arguments. If you don't know what memoization is, it's essentially taking a function that will be expensive to run each time. You remember what it's being called with, and if it's being called with the same arguments again, you just return that from a cache, essentially. Now, you can do this with mutable defaults, but again, I would prefer to do it. I'm using decorators too much in this call. In this talk, but still, we have a decorator here. So it's the same deal. We have a decorator, we take a function, we add some mutable state, and then in this wrapping function, we have a key, we check to see if in the key this key exists, and if it doesn't exist, we call the function with our arguments, save the return value in our calls here, and then return the return value. This means the next time we call it, 
we're going to be using this dictionary instead of using the function itself. We save valuable time in doing this. And again, if you understand decorators, this is perfectly obvious. It doesn't mess around with any of the function internals and doesn't lead to anything weird in terms of what we told you for arguments can do. If you want to see it work, So, I have a function quite simple here. It's A and B, add them together, print running function. The first time I run this, I expect a 3, and I expect it to print running function. And it does. Second time I run it, it won't print running function because we just go straight into the calls dictionary. We go into our non local mutable state, take something out of that, and return back. There you go. No printing of the running function. Now, again, this can be reused for any function. It can't be messed around with. I can't access my calls dictionary, so I can't go into it and change anything. It's completely safe from that kind of attack, and bugs are much less likely as a result. And again, if you understand decorators, it should be relatively easy to understand. Okay? So, my children for a second then. Ignore them, they're not part of the talk. So, in conclusion, avoid shared references. They tend to cause really weird bugs and often don't know what they're doing. Avoid default mutable arguments. I have not yet seen a good use case for them. But don't avoid mutability and non-local scope. It can actually create some really powerful tools as long as you keep it clear and obvious and don't overcomplicate it too much. Cool. So. We do have time for two questions, actually. Cool. So, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. We have no microphone. Sorry. Okay. Where is good? Where is good? Yeah. So I was I arguing. Any good? <laughs> That's great feedback for me. Uh, as I say, with good, it's kind of questionable. I would say this bit here is a decent use of mutability. There's not many other ways to kind of implement this kind of solution without mutability. I say. If you're just looking at circuit dependencies, you can, but if you want to do something where you're always running functions before and after you're running something else, this works quite well. And more or less need mutability in that kind of system. Uh, again, to memorization, you need mutability to store the calls you've made previously somewhere, um, so you have to use it there. The question becomes default mutable arguments or a decorator like this. In fact, you use if you just use LU cache from functals, it more or less works in a quite similar fashion to this. That's a decent and required use of mutability. But good principle that uh, side effect is the fact that you can handle language. Yeah, so the key here is to avoid unexpected side effects, right? So by doing this and keeping it here, you can't actually access this and change it in any way except within this wraps function, right? So it can't be changed. If you understand what this wraps function does, it's only ever going to do that. Same here, where we make the callables outside of a class. If we put it inside the class, then you can access that callables and change it in any way you want, which is not what we expect. All right, so this way is only used for one purpose, and that purpose is defined very close to where we define the mutability. So it should be clear. I understand the doubts, though. Okay, what if you have a threat? If you have a threat? Yeah, yeah threats are a bit different. So this works in process. Outside of process, you want to start thinking about other tools, like an external cache, for instance. But that's a different point. I'm thinking single process here. Fantastic. I think that comes like two questions. So uh, if, we, <laughs> um, if we could thank Nick again. Um. Thank you very much. And if I could ask for the next speaker to please come up and